Let's all stand all over the building. I'm glad y'all are here, but I'm looking forward to when we all get to heaven. So let's sing this together. Here we go. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling, When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon His beauty will be home. Soon the pearly What a day of rejoicing that will be, and when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved. A wretch like me, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see, t'was grace that taught my heart. My fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ran i 
like a flood His mercy reigns Unending of love Amazing grace The earth shall soon dissolve Like snow the sun for bed shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine you are forever can be seated if you can I don't know if you can wow good looking Wednesday night bunch you don't know what we've been looking at on Wednesday night one piece of cardboard in the back and one over here on the side this is awesome now those on the be watching this on YouTube will be looking like where are they at believe me folks they're all hiding that's the way we do in Baptist churches right we sit around the edges and in the back I'm so thankful to see each of you here tonight open your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 3 Acts chapter 3. So now, well, we've been teaching and you haven't been here. I've been assuming that you would agree and you would answer some questions. So when I ask a question, I want you to answer. Because the Sunday morning, 830 crowd, they did an outstanding job. It's a 1030 crowd just for you that are here. They didn't do real good at answering questions. So I almost felt like it was just that back row and one row over here. So listen. Just listen to the Word of God tonight and speak. Change your focus. What's your focus on tonight? What is it that you focus on tonight? Now, let me tell you about this story that continues, continues, excuse me, from the book of Acts. We've finished up with verse 10. Tonight we want to continue verse 11 through 21, and we'll talk about verse 1 through 10 briefly. Peter speaks to the onlookers. Verse 11 says, While the man held on to Peter and John. You remember the man? This is the crippled man that was by the gate, the beautiful gate. This is the man that Peter told him, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Rise and walk. And the man got up, his crippled feet and legs, and he jumped with joy, and he celebrated, and he danced, and he went into the temple. Now they're in the temple. While the man held on to Peter and John, and the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, so I'm telling you fellow Calvaryites tonight, okay? Listen, here it is. Why does this surprise you? Why? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power, or godliness, we made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of your fathers, or our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed. Now he's preaching now, listen. You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate, though Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. Verse 14. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. Remember, Jesus could have been let go. Said, who do you want? And they yell what? Barabbas. So, you got what you asked for. You kill the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And that ought to make somebody say Amen. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him as you can see. 
Man, I'm telling you, Peter, the one who denied Jesus three times. Peter, the one who had preached after receiving the Holy Spirit and 3,000 lives are changed. Peter is preaching to these folks right now. You get that? He said, now fellow Israelites, now fellow Calvaryites tonight, I know that you've acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, prophets saying that his Messiah would suffer. Now Peter cuts to the chase, right? Peter says, repent then. Repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out or blotted out or forgiven. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Verse 21. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything. Can I tell you, that day is coming sooner than later. As he promised long ago through the holy prophets. Let's pray together. Father, come to you in that name of Jesus the one who ascended, the one who is sitting at the right hand of the Father, who is awaiting the command to come back and to take home the church. God, I pray that we're ready. And I pray that we be reminded tonight that you are King of kings and Lord of lords, and you are in charge. We may think we are. The devil may think he's having a heyday on this earth. But I'm telling you, Father, I believe according to your word, and I pray that everyone here would believe it and trust it and put their faith in it, that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. And I pray, Father, your will would be done. Let me hide tonight. Let your word speak deep into our hearts. Father, I pray your will would be accomplished as we teach your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you, church. Well, Sunday we looked at the first part of this lesson. And maybe you remember. Maybe. Maybe you remember. Peter, he, he kind of he laid it on him just a little bit. He said that you people have desired murder for this man. You people denied the Lord. And then he told them, but guess what? You can still repent. So the second part of Peter's sermon is here, and it's found only in verse 19 and 20. He's he's really just telling the story, and then he tells us what to do here in verse 19 and 20. And 19 says, repent. Folks, I'm just telling you, you know what our nation needs? To repent. Do you know what you need in your life? Remember I said if you got sin in your family... Guess what you got? A messed up family. A family needs to repent. And if we get sin in this church, and we do, but if we get a sin in our church and it's a church cooperative thing, we, we need to repent. If you get sin in your life individually, there's no other answer. No other answer except repent. Turn. I, I said something Sunday morning. I got a, at least one uh, encouraging question about it. I said we don't need to be Redeemed or reformed, we need to be what? Transformed. We do need redemption. And we do, we do need to be uh, redeemed. But I'm telling you, you're transformed by the renewing of your what? Your mind. We need to be transformed. Peter says, repent. So folks, you can desire this, you can desire that, you can deny this, you can deny that, but we must decide in our heart to repent. So here we are, second part, Peter says, repent. And then he tells them what to do. Repent, turn around, go the other way, and go where? Turn to God. And why do you do that? So that your sins may be what? Wiped out, forgiven, blotted out. Now, then he goes on to say, so that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. I don't know about you, but I need refreshment. Sometimes it comes in a bottle of water. Sometimes it comes in just sitting down and resting. But better than that, my spirit needs refreshing, and that can only come from God above. We need to be refreshed. And that comes from the Lord. Look, verse 20. And that he may send the Messiah... Who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. So, two things he says. 
your sins will be blotted out, and Jesus will return to his earthly kingdom. Those two things is what happens when we repent. Well, don't forget, don't forget, everybody Peter is talking to in this book and in this illustration were Jews. And the Jewish people, they were thoroughly committed and thoroughly commit, uh, uh, familiar with Old Testament. That's what they knew. So Peter uses the Old Testament and preaches Christ to them. Now, now some would say, not us, because we use the Old Testament and we preach Jesus through the Old Testament. But in their culture, they would say, Jesus wasn't in the Old Testament. Well, let me just tell you, he was. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the seed of the woman would come and crush the head of the serpent. Can I just tell you? That's Jesus Christ. Genesis 3, 15. In Leviticus, they were commanded to take male lambs with no spots or blemish and sacrifice them on an altar. Can I tell you? That was Jesus. As a matter of fact, there are many passages, and we could spend the rest of our time together tonight doing that. But let me tell you, Jesus is found from Genesis to Revelation. You know why? Because the whole Bible, every book in this Bible is about Jesus. That's who it's about. So Peter here in Acts chapter 3 shares some promises with the people. Verse 19. Peter tells them, your sins will be wiped away or your sins will be blotted out. Well, what does that blotted out mean? What does that mean to blot something out? Can I just tell you? It means to eliminate. It means to erase. Old things are passed away. Behold what? All things. I know somebody won't believe that that's here tonight. I looked it up. They have not changed the definition of all. It still means just that. Everything. All your sins. The key is repentance is saying the same thing about your sin that God does. Now, that's the tricky part. That's the part we don't really like to talk about. But if we'll do that, according to the Word of God, not just here, but many other places, that's what will happen. Did you know that this same promise still applies today? If you repent of your sin, say what God says, the Word of God promises that every last sin will be blotted out. My question tonight is, to you, to us, is why in the world would we keep sinning? If we can have our sins forgiven, if we can have our sins blotted out, why in the world would we keep running from God? Jonah tried to do this. You remember that story? Jonah tried to run from his sin. But the only thing he proved is that you can't run fast enough or far enough to hide from your sins. That's what he proved. King David, he proved it. We can try, but we cannot hide from our sins. I'm telling you, Anais and Sapphira Sapphira did the same thing. And what did they do? They ran from it and lost their lives. Because they tried to lie their way out of their sin. Now listen, don't miss this. You can't hide from your sin. You can hide it from some people, but you cannot hide from your sin. You cannot. You can't lie your way out of your sin. You can try, but you can't do it. Phil Robertson just proved this. I don't know if you happen to watch his podcast. He has a podcast out there, Unashamed. I would encourage you to subscribe to it and listen to it. You can watch it on YouTube, but also if you do podcasts, you can watch it. Unashamed. Phil Robinson, back at the end of last year, end of 2019, was issued a letter. He's had hundreds of them in his life. The Robinson family continually received some kind of bogus thing saying that they're long-lost cousins or something or another. But Phil is preaching the last Sunday in December. Jace, of above all people, is leading worship that day. And in the service that day is a lady in her 40s. And that lady has brought a letter that day and wanting to meet Phil to give him a letter stating that she's had a DNA test done and it would indicate that he is her father. Now we just know Phil has four boys. Three bearded, one unbearded, right? That's what we know. We know the Robinson family, Duck Dynasty, if you hadn't picked that up now. 
But she didn't do that that day. She actually gave Jace a copy of it, and she mailed a copy to Alan, who is the pastor of the church. Alan was out of town. Weeks have gone by, and just within the last month or so, this letter has been read, and they have confronted Dad, Phil, and they have talked about it with Dad and Mom, and Phil has gone and had a DNA test done, and guess what? Phil is the father of this young lady, 45 years old. So I thought Phil had been a Christian a long time. He has, less than 45 years. He was married to Miss Kay. And in a drunken stupor, a drug party, whatever, Phil has no recollection, no knowledge, nothing about this situation, doesn't know anything about it. Can I just tell you that your sins will find you out? Now, I tell you that for God to get the glory, not to bring any kind of bad point to that. The point is, Phil graciously received that. The whole family has embraced that. As a matter of fact, showing you God's grace and mercy, Miss Kay said she's been telling Phil for 50 years. One of these days, somebody's going to show up here, and we're going to find out what happened before Christ with you, buddy. And she always thought it'd be another son since he has four, but it's not. It's a daughter. And Miss Kay loves this girl, and they love this family. And it's just amazing, the story. Go, go, watch, go watch and listen to the, to the podcast. You will be absolutely amazed at God's grace and mercy shown in that illustration. Well, can I tell you this? God's not going to allow any sin into heaven. Now, chew on that one a minute or two. You can't hide it. God's not going to allow any sin into heaven. And this is really where the problem starts. So what can we do about our sin? We can run from it. But there's no avail. So let me tell you, you can't run from it. We can hide it. But you can't hide it from God. So that has no avail. You can lie about it. But we can't lie our way out of our sin either to no avail. So this is the one question that we all try to avoid today. It's a question that we don't like to face. It's a question that pulpits today have stopped preaching about. And that's why I'm preaching about it tonight, sin. But I must ask you this question tonight. I must ask you this question. What are you going to do about your sin? The sin in your life that you've not confessed. Let let me just tell you, when I die, everything I got is going to Beverly. Everything I got is going to Beverly. And we talked about a lot of things and how that works out. And we've made a lot of preparations. Our heads are filled with questions and how will that all be? And when will that, you know, occur? And what will that look like for her to deal with and all that? But in reality, let me tell you, it's, it's bigger than this. But in reality... In less than five seconds, you know, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi. In less than that. As a matter of fact, listen, listen. Hear how quick that is? In that amount of time, that won't be the question about what I have here. It'll be the kind of question that I'm going to have to answer God about what about my sin. Because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. And I don't think that's going to be no dragging out situation. I think it's going to happen. Absent from the body. Present with the Lord. My dad passed away in our home. When my dad passed away, I was in there with him. and I'd gone to get him a biscuit and me a biscuit and a cup of coffee and come back. And he wasn't wanting to eat, but he had agreed a biscuit. And I came back in the room. When I walked into the room, walked over to the bed, <laughs> dad was gone. I remember my feelings about that. I looked at him. I checked his pulse. Didn't feel anything. I put my ear down to his mouth. And have you ever listened to a seashell? It's a big seashell like in the store. Whatever. You know that sound? You know that noise that you hear when you do that? By the way, I hear that all the time. That's because I damaged my ears years ago. So when I don't hear you, it's not that I don't want to. I hear that all the time. But that's the sound I heard. You know why? Because my dad was absent from the body. Present with the Lord. If he'd been born again. 
And his testimony, he said he had. I'm not the judge of that. That's between him and God, right? Amen? Come on now. Don't let me leave you here. Come on with me. So here's what will happen. I'm going to have to answer the question. What about your sin? I saw some pictures recently on the internet and people, the faces of the crowd during all this. I saw a young lady with a mask on looking, looking with a very solemn face as a building is burning or as people were throwing and looting and doing things. I saw a young lady in disbelief. I, I saw a mother I saw a mother standing in the window, a picture, somebody, a photographer taken of a mother watching what was going on down on the streets. I saw, during this pandemic, I saw nurses standing there looking. Now, let me, let me tell you, all those things are important, but let me tell you what, they're really not that important because the most important thing in your life and my life is what are you going to do with your sin? Hear my heart right here. What are you going to do about your sin? Peter didn't say repent and there won't be any more tragedies in the world. Peter didn't say repent and there won't be any more pandemics. Peter didn't even say anything about repent, you'll be healthy and wealthy, as many of these prosperity preachers preach. Because a lot of those people don't even mention repentance. I'm telling you tonight, what Peter promised is better than that. He said, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have, what I do have is better than that, arise and walk. And now he's telling them, repent, and your sins will be blotted out. Now, I don't know what you think about that, but I'm telling you, on my behalf, that's great news. <laughs> that is great news, even today. And as I minister my job is to make sure that you and I realize that this message is for us tonight. It's still available. It's still real tonight. This promise is not based on my authority. It's not even based on my opinion. It's based on the Word of God. The Bible says, repent and your sin will be blotted out. Forgiven. There are many, many in our culture, in our world, they're, they're, they're hungry for something that the world can't offer. I mean, I, I believe there's a lot of confusion, a lot of misbelief, a lot of, a, a lot of misunderstanding. Listen, I, I believe there's a lot of stuff the devil is using in our culture today to keep people like you and I from repenting so our sins can be blotted out. Listen, people have been calling me for three months talking. What are y'all doing? Can I see what you're doing? Would you send me information? Would you talk? Uh, do I believe any of those people are coming here and go to church? Maybe a few. But what I do believe is that if those people are obedient to the Word of God, their sins can be blotted out. Are you with me here? I know this. My life was a wreck before Jesus. I was headed down a one-way street, and that street ended up in hell. And if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus and the grace and the mercy of the living God that sent His one and only Son to die on the cross at Calvary for me and to allow me to be forgiven for my sins, I'm telling you, folks, I'm telling you, there was nothing good for me. There was nothing good going to happen to me in my life because of me. So there are people who are hungry today, hungry for stuff. And the world doesn't have an answer. They know it's found in Jesus. And they, they won't accept it, but they need you and I to go tell them how to get it. As a matter of fact, many hungry people are really hungry for something more than food. They're hungry for peace and hope and all of those things. Well, let me just tell you, I found a place to get that answer. As a matter of fact, I, I shook my head in disbelief. I thought I've entered the wrong place. I thought, after all, I couldn't possibly be welcome at this place. I mean, i have been given an invitation to this place several times. Some of you. Others had come to my home by several different people. 
But I finally decided to come and see what this was all about. But this place that I walked in just couldn't be the right place. This couldn't be a place, really, that I was invited to. Quickly, <clears throat> I glanced down and looked at the invitation. I looked at the invitation and decided I was in the wrong place, but the invitation had my name. It said, come as you are, Bill. Come as you are. I looked at my hands. I looked at my clothing. I, I looked and I, I quickly glanced around at the crowd and I I, I just scanned again at the invitation. Come as you are. Come as you are. I thought, well, I made it to the right location because it's got the address, it's got the place I'm supposed to come to. I looked in the window and I saw all the people inside and they looked different than I looked. All the people inside had a smile on their face. They had joy in their heart. They all were dressed nicely. They appeared strangely different than I. I thought, this is some kind of restaurant that I'm not going to be welcome at. Ashamed, I looked down, I looked, I should have changed clothes, I should have come in something nicer. My body was covered with stains, I was dirty, in fact, I was really filthy. But my invitation said, Bill Ross, come as you are. Come as you are. I thought the smell that I smelled, that must be me. I should have showered, I should have shaved, I should have cleaned up before I came. The grime on my body. I turned to leave, but just as I started to leave, the young lady said, where are you going, sir? Do you need some help? And I said, well, I have this invitation. And she said, oh, come right in. There's a special place for you in here. The reservation has been made on your behalf, Bill Ross. I smiled and looked and I thought, how can this be? How can this be? I put my hands deep in my pockets, not to keep from social distancing, but just because I didn't want them to see the dirt up under my fingernails. I was hoping I could conceal a little of my dirt and shame. She said, come this way, sir. The table over here is just for you. With a smile on my face, I said, yes, ma'am, thank you. Keeping my head lowered the whole time. She led me to the table, and sure enough, sure enough, there was a tag on the table, a placard that said, Bill Ross, come as you are. I couldn't believe my eyes. Now, notice the invitation was snow white with the letters Bill Ross written in red. As I browsed over the menu, I, I saw all these things listed. I saw things like peace and joy and blessings and confidence. Assurance and hope and love and faith and mercy. And then I realized, I realized this wasn't an ordinary restaurant I was in. As a matter of fact, I flipped to and fro through the menu in order to see that there was another sign that said, this is God's grace. I couldn't believe what I'd read. I couldn't believe I'd been invited to this place. Later, the young lady came. She said, I'd recommend to you the special of the day. With it, you're entitled to heaping portions of everything on this menu, sir. I thought, you got to be kidding. Peace and joy and happiness and blessings and confidence, assurance and hope and love and faith and mercy. I get heaping portions of that. I said, no way. The special of the day is for me. And then I noticed just below that, the special of that day was salvation. And I thought, is this really true? I mean, am I really in a restaurant that offers this? I said, I'll take it. I'll take the salvation. I practically cried out, I'm sick. I'm, I'm all messed up. I don't deserve to be in this place. I'm a jerk. I'm a miserable human being. I'm filthy. I'm full of sin. But I read the word again, salvation. Between the sobs, I said, ma'am, look at me. I'm dirty. I'm nasty. I'm unclean. I'm unworthy. I have all of this stuff in my life. And besides that, I can't afford the cost of this restaurant. 
The young lady looked at me and said, Sir, your check has already been paid for. Your check has already been taken care of by the gentleman over there. Pointed at the corner of the room, and as I looked over there, there was a gleaming, gleaming, glowing light. And I said, Who is that? And she said, His name is Jesus. He has covered the cost of your meal. Turning that way and looking, what seemed to be the brightest light in the room I'd ever seen, it's almost too bright to look at. I find myself getting up out of my seat and walking towards Jesus. My hands were shaking, my voice was shaking, and I whispered, Sir, I'll wash the dishes, I'll sweep the floors, I'll take out the trash, I'll do anything and everything that you'll let me do to pay for all of this. He simply opened his hands and said with a smile, Son, all of this is yours if you'll simply come unto me. I said, sir, please, ask me to clean up, and I will. Ask me to take out uh, the stains, and, and, and I'll do it. I'll do anything. And Jesus said, no, what you do is come unto me, and I'll take care of all of those things. So here's what I want you to remember about this story of me going to this restaurant. Here's a story in a nutshell. There's a table reserved for each of us in our own name. And all we need to do is accept the offer that Jesus gave me that night. Astonished, at that moment I fell to his feet. And I said, please Jesus, please clean up my life. Please change me and sit me at your table and give me a new way of life. Immediately. I heard the voice of Jesus say, it is finished. I looked down and white robes adorned my squeaky clean body that was previously filthy, dirty rag. Something strange, something wonderful had happened. I felt like a weight had been lifted off of me and I found myself seated at his table that said, the special of the day has been served at this table. Today, salvation is yours. We sat and we talked for a great while, and I enjoyed the time that I had spent with him. He told me, of all people, that he would like for me to come back as often as I desire to for helpings of God's grace. He made it clear that he wanted me to spend as much time with him as possible. Don't miss this. As it drew near to the time for me to go outside back into the real world, he simply said something very softly to me as I got up to leave. And he said this, And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. And then he said something that changed me, and I'll never forget. And he said, my child, do you see these empty tables throughout this room? And I said, yes, Lord, I see them. What do they mean? And he simply replied, these tables were reserved for people just like you. Names on every table of people that have not accepted the invitation to dine here yet. Would you be so kind to take those invitations with you as you leave and to go out into the community, into the highways and the hedges? And would you ask them to come and join us on another day? I said, of course. Of course I'll go. Of course I'll tell others. I was so excited as I picked up the invitation. And he said, go therefore ye to all the nations. All the nations. And I turned to leave. Folks, this is a story of walking into God's grace, dirty and hungry, and a messed up, stained up life with sin. My righteousness, your righteousness, clearly nothing but filthy rags. But because of Jesus, he cleaned me up. I walked out a brand new man. A brand new man, robed in white, 
covered with his righteousness. And so, and so I'll keep that promise. I'm telling you, I'll keep that promise. I'll go, I'll spread the word, I'll share the gospel, I'll hand out the invitations, and I'll start tonight with you, and I'll start tomorrow with the next person, and I'll do it day after day and week after week. I'm telling you, folks, we've been to the table. We've been to God's grace. If you've been born again, you have received the gift of life. God's word has clearly told us if we would confess our sin, if we would repent of our sins, he would cleanse us and make us new. We must remember, church. We must remember. The church is not here to exist for the sake of existing. We missed three months of study and time together. But I'm telling you, the task is before us. Our nation needs Jesus more than ever before. You say, well, that's there. That's not here. No, it's not there. It's right here in Knox Shelby County. It's people that you and I have influence over to tell them day after day and week after week and month after month and year after year. We need to tell people how Jesus changed our lives. I'm telling you, I was on a one-way ticket straight to hell. And I was invited to a meal much like this. My meal didn't happen at a place like that. It happened at a seat about where Brother John or Sister Faye, one of them sitting right in there. That's where my ticket happened. And I came here, and I'm telling you, God changed my life. Never been the same. Perfect? No. Sin today? Yes. But if you'll confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you, make you new again. We don't serve a God of one chance. We serve a God of a, another chance. Folks, I'm telling you, will you tonight, will you tonight draw a line in the sand? You've been born again? You know what? You've got a task. You've got a task to go tell others about Jesus. If you're here tonight and you know that you've never been born again, tonight's the night to accept the gift of salvation. I'm telling you, we need to be telling every opportunity we have, telling people about the work of Christ, what he did in your life. You got a story? We, you tell them whenever we do testimonies. You've got a story of God's grace and mercy in your life. Do you deserve it? Do you deserve that grace and mercy? Absolutely not. But I accept it nonetheless. Amen? We join me tonight? A newfound commitment tonight. Accepting the gift and tonight saying, you know what? I'm going to start telling others about Jesus like never before. Father, I ask you to empower us and strengthen us to repent so that every sin would be blotted out. God, everyone in this room is a sinner that was in need of a Savior. If everyone here has accepted that gift, if everyone here has been born again, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Now we need to go to work. If all of us have been sharing our faith and, and telling people what you've done in our lives, hallelujah, let us do it some more. But if by chance, if some stretch of an imagination on a Wednesday night, first in-person Wednesday night that we've had in over three months, if by chance someone tonight knows for sure that they've never been born again, today is the day of salvation. Tonight is the night to surrender and give their life to you, Father. But regardless of which way we are tonight, Father, I pray that we would repent, every one of us, for the forgiveness of sins. Our sins would be blotted out and we would be a living, breathing testimony for the grace and mercies of God. Thank you, Father, for your written word. Thank you, Father, for these here tonight. Father, I pray that your word has spoken some way in our hearts and lives that we would be changed, changed, reformed, and transformed by the renewing of our minds. Thank you, Father, for these. Bless us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.